My guest today is Scott Hunter. Scott, how are you? I am doing well, David. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Uh, for those that don't know, tell us what you do. Um, I work at Microsoft uh, in developer division. Um, currently, I work on the Azure Developer Experience team. So we build a lot of the uh, services you might use to host your code in Azure. Uh, we build all the tools for Azure, uh, whether it's command line, VS Code, or Visual Studio. We build the SDKs for Azure. Um, and of course, most folks know me because I've spent, you know, like the last 15 years working on .NET at Microsoft, ASP.NET especially, but uh, all of .NET in the long run. Well, that has had a huge impact on my life. <laughs> and you're working on something cool right now that you were telling me about. Tell everyone, what, what's what's the cool thing that's coming out from Microsoft and your division right now? Yeah, so I, you know, just at the build conference a few weeks ago, we released .NET Aspire. Um, and, um, you know, my team builds all of the tools for Aspire, meaning we build all the tools for publishing an Aspire application to the cloud. Um, and uh, we can talk about a little bit, you know, what we build, what Aspire is and all those things. But, uh, you know, just, just to kind of kick off, you know, Aspire is a cloud native framework for .NET developers. Okay. We, we like to think that. Um, .NET's always been, you know, especially ASP.NET Core has always been a, a great technology for building cloud-based applications. Um, but this is the first time we've had a, what I would call an opinion about what a cloud native app should actually look like. Um, you know, if you're a Java developer or if you've been a Java developer, you might, uh, you know, have been involved with a, a framework called Spring which is a, a framework in the Java yeah. world that is kind yeah. of considered to be a cloud native framework. And in, in many ways, um, we are both inspired by Spring, um, but also uh, you know, some stuff we, we, we can dive into, David, is um, I like to think that we've built all the tech in .NET over the last five or six years to make it cloud native. We just haven't turned it on by default. And we can, talk, we can kind of talk through that. Yeah, okay. So, so turning it on by default is a major goal of .NET Aspire, right? Yeah, so let me let me give people an example of what I mean by, you know, when I say turn on by default, there's a whole bunch of capabilities that we've built into um, .NET over the years. Um, if I go back in, in time and, and, and think of uh, in, in ASP.NET Core 3.0, we added uh, support for what we call resiliency um, in the HTTP client. And what that means is a proper HP client should probably have a, uh, some code hooked up to it that says, hey, if I try to make this web request and it fails, don't error out right away, try again. Um, you try logic. And that just might be because, you know, as I think of it in the cloud, you know, when I'm, when I'm thinking on in my house, yeah, everything's on my own machine, it's perfect, it's always gonna work, but uh, the reality is, you know, we've all been on web pages that feel a little slow one day, they feel fast the next day, you want to make your application be resilient to that that kind of thing, and so uh, we added support for resiliency in um, HTTP client. We created a, a client factory, and you could use Poly. That's a library, that, uh, open source library out there, to add those those kinds of patterns to your uh, HTTP client. Um, we added that same support to Entity Framework Core, um, and the idea once again is you're calling your SQL database. Maybe it times out once, and you don't want to you don't want to error out right away. You just want to retry. And so we added uh, both of those capabilities to um, the technology back back in ASP.NET Core, .NET Core 3. Um, we also added something in that same time frame. We added health checks. Um, and for folks that don't know, if you're running in the cloud, um, especially in, with a with a cloud orchestrator, in this case, I'm thinking of something like Kubernetes, um, the orchestrator wants to know that all the, the virtual machines are healthy. And so what it wants to do is it wants an endpoint it can call uh, to kind of do a check on the on the app and see if the app's healthy. And so we added support for health checks. Um, I want to say that was back in ASP.NET Core 3 as well. Um, and then a couple of versions ago, we added um, um, open telemetry to .NET. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. When we were rebooting .NET uh, back in, you know, .NET Core 1.0, uh, one of the things that came to mind to us was we never had great, very good telemetry in the... Um, .NET Framework days. If you if you ever played with ASP.NET Web Forms, um, we didn't have good ways of 
knowing what was going on. So we, right. you know, we've been trying to add better telemetry to .NET, um, and we want .NET to support open telemetry, which means there's plenty of monitoring tech out there, whether it's um, App Insights inside of Azure, it could be Datadog. Um, in, in Aspire, we actually wrote our own dashboard that understands uh, telemetry as well. But uh, so what happens is, if you have an existing ASP.NET project today, ASP.NET Core project, you can right click on it. Um, and in the right click menu, there'll be add, add Aspire orchestration. When you right click and do that, what's gonna happen is we're gonna create two new projects. We're gonna create a app host project uh, and we're gonna create a service defaults project. And so all these defaults, we just kind of talk, talk through a little bit. What happens is when I right click and say add Aspire orchestration, we add these two projects to your solution and we will call the service defaults project. Uh, we're going to call it, the, we're going to add a method to your program.cs. It's going to call that. Um, we made all those defaults uh, project on purpose because we gave you our opinion of what those defaults should be, but you might want to change some of those defaults to whatever you know makes you happy. And so the cool okay. thing is you can go look at that project. You can go look at the source code for it. You could decide, you know, hey, I don't want to have health checks in my project. You could just comment that line out. And they're gone. Right. Um, but we, you know, Aspire is not just about solving defaults. Um, and and I am happy with all these defaults. These are these are things that uh, I do think most .NET projects need and would want. And um, especially if you're going to run in the cloud, they're they're super cool. But there's a couple of other problems that we want to solve uh, with Aspire as well. Um, one of those being, you know, we've all probably done multi-part web applications. You got a Blazor application uh, and you have a, an ASP.NET Web API project that's the back end for the Blazor application. You're in Visual Studio and hmm, how do I make both of these projects run? Uh, you know, you can right click and, and, and uh, there's a you know, startup projects um, link in the, in the menu and you can right. select them both, run them both. You can select the order. Uh, it's kind of klutzy. Um, you know, once you do that, that's great for Visual Studio, but if you go to VS Code, you know, you're likely going to open each project in your own VS Code, in different VS Codes, and you're going to run them independently or manually. We've never had a, we've never had great support from, uh, for .NET projects that need multiple things to run at the same time to run. Yeah. And so that's a, that's a component of, of um, Aspire as well. There's the new project. It's called the App Host, okay. and I call that the orchestrator. That's the... That's the project that you kind of tell tell us, here's all the projects I want you to run. And so inside of that uh, app host, there'll be a program.cs and you're going to do something like builder.addproject and you're going to okay. give us the, uh, the project that you uh, want to run. I'm and, actually looking and, at uh, my sample <laughs> uh, Aspire project right now. I went into the Visual Studio and said file new Aspire project that created... <laughs> the app host and the service defaults, as well as a web app and an API and things like that. Yep. So it, it's going to have a builder, just like an ASP.NET Core project has a builder. But in, in this case, it's a it's a distributed application builder. And you're going to do an add project for each of the projects. Um, and uh, the add project method also lets you do um, a dot with reference on it. And so what you do is, let's say I have a, a API and I have a web front end. Um, I'm going to make my, I'm going to, I want my API to start first. So I'm going to tell my web front end, I'm going to do an add project web front end dot with reference to the API project. Um, and that lets us go build up the order that these things should start. And so uh, what the app host does is it, it kind of lets you configure the order that the projects all run. And uh, what we do is when you right click and add um, Aspire orchestration to your project, we make the app host the default project. So when you control F5 or F5, it's going to run that project, and that project will then start all the other projects for you. Um, oh, I see. I'm, I'm looking at the code right now. It says builder.add project, and the web front end is first. But with that, it says with external HTTP endpoints, with reference cache, and then with reference API service. And that's the order. It'll it'll start cache before it starts the API service. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Oh, yep. interesting. Okay. You're basically I telling us the that. order to run things there. And you, you, you also notice you said with external HTTP endpoints, right? What, you might ask, why is, why is that there? Why is that there, Scott? Um, <laughs> that, that tells us when we publish your app to the cloud, 
that we want that project to actually be visible to the public internet. Uh, I see. Notice that your API project did not have a with external mm. HTTP endpoints. Only my web project can call it the only your web. If you, if you added dot with just... external HTTP endpoint to the web to the API project, it would make that project visible on the internet as well. So if you if you I do see. have an API that you want to make public, but in this case, the only thing that's ever going to call my API project is going to be my Blazor application. And so Got it. Um, only the Blazor application needs to be um, open to the internet is what Got I would it. say. I like the fact also this gets checked into source control. And so you don't have the issue of once I get pro check projects out of source control, then I've got to configure what's going to start up and what's the order. I don't have an extra, that extra manual step. Yeah. So let's talk about something else. I, I mentioned before, you know, that we're not great at doing multi-run projects. And so this, this, this app host is our new multi-runner. And, you know, as you said, you know, in, in the code you were looking at, you saw the add projects for both of the projects and you saw the order. Um, if you've ever done that right click and done the startup and, and done the startup project thing where you actually run more than one project, mm -hmm. well, what, what IP address and port do we run your API project and your Blazor project on? What we, what we do today is we um, create a project called, uh, we create a file called launch settings.json. It's in your uh, properties folder and in your projects. And inside of that, if you open one of those up, um, you're going to find that we hard code a random uh, port on, and typically localhost. So we'll do localhost and some random port for your projects. That's great. Um, but that means my Blazor project, I'm going to go look in the API projects properties folder. I'm going to open launch settings.json. I'm going to find that, that localhost and that port. And I'm going to hard code that somewhere in my Blazor project so it knows how to call the API. Um, okay. This, this is not good because we just hard coded something. Especially and, as localhost. Um, local <laughs> it's not going to work when you publish it. And so how do we solve that? And that, that's, a, that's another big component of, of Aspire. Uh, and it's something we call service discovery. And so when that, in, as part of that, that's, that uh, service, def the service defaults, one of the things you're going to see inside of there, um, if you open up the file that it creates, is there's going to be a, a builder.services.add service discovery. Um, and what that lets us do is that lets us solve this hard coded IP address problem. And let me explain how we, why we, how we kind of do that. When you do that, um, add project and your app host, you actually give the project a name. So I could say API for my backend. I could say web front end for my front end. Um, and then what happens is when we boot up the application, the app host boots the applications up. What we do is we um, take those, those ports and we stick them into a environment variable. And so what that means is, um, and you can see this from our, I'll, we talked about the dashboard in a second, but what happens is when we start up, um, you know, these, these projects boot up and we go find out what their IP and port are. Um, and we go stick that environment variable into the projects. And so that's, and what we do is we'll give it the name. So that name, you know, front end, web front end, uh, there'll be an environment variable with a, with a certain syntax that'll have web front end on it. Um, and it'll have the IP address and port of the web front end. Um, and what it means is in my Blazor application, when I want to reference my API, I just do HTTP uh, colon uh, whack whack um, API. And then what happens behind the scenes is there's some magic going on where we go and take that word API and we go look at the right environment variable to go find the port and IP address of that. And we transpose that in. Um, and this means that uh, no longer am I, am I hard coding IP addresses and ports in my application. We're letting the uh, orchestration do that for us, which means hmm. when I move this app from on-premise to the cloud, boom, it just works. Um, I don't have to worry about changing those things. And so this is a, um, you know, these are probably two of the biggest, big improvements are great multi-run support um, and service discovery. So we don't hard code IP addresses and ports through our applications. Meaning I can give you the app, it runs on your machine, it runs on my machine, it runs in Azure, it runs in AWS, um, you know, wherever. And so th these are probably the couple of the biggest things. It's like we turn all, all the right things on by default, uh, we give you service discovery to solve the IP address port problems. We have great multi-run support, multi-project support. 
Um, and, and the multi-project support is from the command line, it's from VS Code, it's from Visual Studio. So unlike the startup projects that we have in Visual Studio, this works in all of our developer tools. Um, but you know, at this point, great, we're, we're making some progress. I wanna get this app running in the cloud and you know, how would I do that? And uh, that's where my team comes into play. Um, um, my team, as I said, builds a lot of the Azure developer tools. And we have a tool called the um, Azure Developer CLI. We call that AZD. Um, you can do aka.ms uh, slash AZD in your browser if you want to go hit the home page for um, AZD. Um, and AZD was something we created uh, about a year ago. And the idea was a lot of the Azure samples at, at that time, you would go to a GitHub repo and grab an Azure sample. And then after you got the code, you'd have to run like 20 command line things to get all the right stuff in the cloud. And the idea behind AZD is to simplify all that. And so there's a special folder called the infra folder uh, in an AZD project. Um, and that's where we store all the cloud scripts and resources and, and, and stuff like that you need. And AZD knows how to um, run that stuff. And so okay. what, I, what I would do, um, first I'm gonna explain how to do it from command line, and then I'll explain how you do it if you're just using one of our tools. Um, from command line, I would go to the folder of my Aspire project and I would type AZD in it. Um, and it's gonna go look at the folder uh, and it's gonna go discover and tell you, it's gonna come back and say, hey, I found an Aspire project. Great. Um, it's gonna ask me for a name. Um, I'll give it a name that I want uh, my cloud resource to be. Um, and then um, what that technically does is it goes and creates the BICEP files. BICEP is the language of Azure. Uh, it's, it, it describes the, the layout of a, the resources you need in Azure. Um, so it makes all the, the right stuff. And then I can type AZD up. And when I do that, it's going to ask me a couple more questions. It's going to say, hey, Scott, what, uh, what region do you want this thing to be in, um, in, in Azure? And then it's going to start um, finding, you know, creating all the resources I need in, in the cloud. And, and for an Aspire project, what we're going to do is it's going to create an Azure Container App uh, for you. Uh, it's going to be an Azure Container App environment. And then it's going to make a container for each of your applications that you have in the project. If you've got a front end and a back end, it's going to make two containers. Um, and then it's going to publish your application into those two containers. Um, hmm. Which is which is pretty cool. We've never had a, a support uh, for doing multi-project publish before either. So you know, before if you built a front end and a back end, you're going to manually do each of these things. And now we look at the app as a whole um, and do that. Now, maybe you're is you it, would ask me, David, is AZD something I can plug into my pipeline, my my CI/CD pipeline? You can as well. So so, so yes. So um, there will be a full there'll be a file that AZD will create for you when you run AZD init. Uh, it'll just be a, a file that shows up in your project. Inside of that file will be the exact text that you would actually paste into your pipeline uh, okay. to make a pipeline for the AZD project. So, uh, um, and uh, we even have a, uh, let me just try it here. Um, there's actually a, a, a command in AZD called AZD pipeline uh, which will help you manage and configure your pipeline as well. So there's a command line you can actually run to go do that. Um, now, something you might you might have said, Scott, that sounds like a lot of magic, um, and and it is magic is sometimes good and sometimes until it, bad. It doesn't work. When, uh, no. I, I, I'll I'll share my story is that I used to do a lot of Spring Boot applications which you mentioned earlier. And the problem, the challenge with Spring Boot is that if, when something goes wrong, it was really hard to troubleshoot because there was some magic, some configuration that I had missed somewhere. And I just had to know to open up this file and change this thing. But the, the line of code that broke didn't tell me that. that you know, that, that was a, you know, even ASP.NET web forms was very similar in that um, a bunch of stuff, a stuff was hooked up in IS, um, a bunch of what we call modules were turned on by default. You know, unless you knew where to go look to go figure out what was being turned on by default, you'd have no idea. Um, lots of magic happened in, in, in ASP.NET Web Forms. And as we were rebooting .NET in 2014 um, with ASP, ASP.NET Core and .NET Core, um, that was one of our goals was to make sure that we didn't have as much magic anymore. And so that's why 
Um, if you look at an ASP.NET Core project, you see there's a builder and the program.cs and it hooks a bunch of stuff up. We wanted to let you see that stuff being hooked up versus um, web forms that have just done it by default. Um, and so we tried to make it more in your face. We, we've, been, we've been dialing it, you know, we, we made in the early versions of ASP.NET Core, we put way too much stuff in the, in the program.cs um, and we, we've dialed it back a little bit. But one of the things we didn't aspire is that we mentioned before, all those defaults are in a project that you own. Um, you can decide to change it however you want to change it. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the goal is not to be magic and hopefully, um, you know, you can, you know, when I demo it, I normally put a breakpoint in the app and go trace through the, the defaults. And so people can see me configuring okay. the defaults and in, in person. Um, yeah. There's one more piece of Aspire I want to make sure that we talk about. We've talked about uh, yes, yes. resilience. We've talked about service discovery. We've talked about publish. And by the way, that publish mechanism, I can right click in, in Visual Studio and and uh, and do a publish. It's going to run the AZD behind the scenes for you. Um, if you want to actually see the resources that AZD created, you can you can do AZD infra sent, and that tells it to put the uh, it'll 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 actually put that uh, infra folder in your project. And the bicep files that we're going to use to publish your app are going to be right there in your face. Um, and so once again, if you want to give that to your ops team so they can, you know, build their scripts to go publish your app, uh, you can do that. But the final piece of Aspire, and notice that we talked about, hey, I published this thing up uh, into container apps. Notice we never wrote a Docker file. Um, you're, you're welcome to write a Docker file if you want, but all this tech works without a Docker file. If you want to write a Docker file, because there's some dependencies that you have, you can do that too. Um, but the final piece, and one of the coolest pieces of Aspire is um, in that in that app host where we had those project references. You mentioned in yours, yeah. you ran the default sample. Uh, you, the, you, you ran the, the uh, Aspire starter project. Notice there was a there was right. a Redis cache in yours. Yes. Yeah. So how does that work? And so. Um, there are Aspire, Aspire packages for many of the things that we uh, commonly think of, things like SQL databases, Postgres, MySQL, Redis. Um, and you can add those packages to your Aspire uh, project. And then inside the app host, you can say, you know, dot add Redis cache. And so, you know, you, you don't, David, I, I assume in your machine, you've not installed uh, Redis on your machine at all. Um, and so how could that I don't think possibly I work? Um, what we do is when we, when we run that code, um, we, will, we will expect Docker for desktop to be running on your machine. And what we'll do is we'll yep. go download the container for Redis and we'll start the Redis uh, container up for you. And boom, you've got Redis on your machine. You can add SQL Server the same way. You can add an Azure storage account the same way. You can add Postgres, MySQL, um, and I love this because it means I can develop locally, but I've not installed a bunch of junk on my machine. They're just, they're just Docker containers, which I can delete anytime I want. Um, I do like and that. even cooler, when I publish that app to, to Azure, um, we'll create the proper um, resource in Azure for you as well. So if you, you know, do a SQL database, locally it runs in a container. In Azure, we create a proper you know, Azure SQL database for you. Um, and so the publish mechanism does that translation and even better, um, just like we saw for our IP addresses and ports, um, we do all the connection string mumbling for you as well. So, um, you know, if, if it noticed that in your, in your project, you did the Aspire uh, starter project and you click the, the checkbox for Redis, it might be checked by default. Um, notice the add Redis just gave it a name. I think it says cache is what it says by default. Cache is the name of it. And yes. so in your in your um, you know web front end, you reference the cache as cache. That's you don't have to have a connection string. Now behind the scenes, we actually make a connection string. We stick it in the environment variables the same way I was talking about before, uh, and we do that translation for you. And that's important because on your local machine, you know your your cache is going to point to your container uh, running Redis. While if you publish this to Azure, um, it could it could be pointing to an Azure resource. Um, so another cool aspect of, of all the stuff we've done with Aspire when it comes to these additional services your app might depend on um, is we also use the best security mechanisms that Azure has. And so in some cases, we'll use something called managed identity, which means there is no actual connection string at all. We just say this service can see this service. 
in some cases, it'll be in an Azure Key Vault. Um, and so I'm super excited that, you know, once you put the app in Azure, we're doing the best practices uh, that we can to make the, the app work. And, you know, the final thing that we, we didn't talk about was when you run an Aspire project, if you run that project locally in your machine right now, your browser will open up to a dashboard. It's not going to open up to the web front end or the yep. web back end. It's going to it's going to open up to a dashboard. And that's important as well because we're, we're running multiple projects. And so we don't know which project you actually want to see the web from. The dashboard will list any of the containers. If your Redis cache would be in a container, um, the front end would be listed, the back end would be listed. And there'll be, you can click right in the dashboard, there'll be links. You can click to open the front end in the browser, open the back end in the browser. Um, um, there's a view button at the far right you can click, and that'll show you all the environment variables and all that kind of stuff for that running project. You can look at the logs for each project, projects that running. Um, and we have, um, you know, structured tracing as well. So if your Blazor front end calls the web API backend, uh, you'll be able to see those calls and see them transfer from one side to the other side. And so it's a, it's a really cool dashboard that shows more than we've ever, ever given you before. Yeah. Um, at the very bottom, there's metrics yeah. that'll show you um, the number of threads that we're using, how much CPU we're using, how much network's going on. Um, and so to me, really nice trouble. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's, um, um, and that dashboard is not just a local thing. When you publish that application up to Azure, um, that same dashboard is available to you in Azure as well. Um, so you can go to the Azure portal. And you can go click the dashboard and you can see these same metrics running for your live, your live project. Um, I, I, do, I will have to say there is one caveat on the dashboard. It doesn't do storage, uh, which means the, the you're, okay. you're going to get, you know, we're keeping that stuff in memory. And so it's not going to, you know, if you, if you go to the dashboard, you're not going to be able to see what happened five days ago. It's going to be more of what's happened in the last X number of hours. Um, but, but that's not a big deal either. You know, you can also just go and add App Insights to your project as well. Um, and App Insights will listen on those same, those same open telemetry endpoints that we're emitting. And then you've got, you know, your your uh, all your metrics are being stored in, in, a, in, in a database and you can look back and see, you know, trends over time. And so uh, um, good stuff. I, I'm, just, this, I'm so excited about this. And it's a lot of it's, good it's, stuff. It's, uh, you know, you can add it to any project, just right click and add it to, a, to any ASP.NET Core project. Um, and get all these benefits without changing any, any lines of code in your project. All right, and this is a living project, right? You're continuing to add features. Yeah, this is we sh you know 1.0 shifted build um, in May, and I I would assume that you're going to see 2.0 um, ship you know at .NET Conf in November when we release .NET 9, um, mm -hmm. and we actually we branded this thing and it's 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 uh, even though it's actually the first version ever. Uh, it has an 8.0 number on it because it ships with .NET 8. Um, and so it, it, went, it went right, right, you know, started at 8. So it's version 8 already. Um, uh, if, if you install the newest Visual Studio update, uh, it'll pull it down. If you're a command line person, you can night, say actually. .NET <laughs> workload install Aspire, and that'll install it on the command line. So you can do either way, but it's, it's G8, available today, fully supported. Um, and... Uh, one of the most exciting things I think we've done in, in the space in a couple of years. It is exciting. We're just about at time. What's the best place for people that are new to this to go learn? learn well, more? I, you know, I, I, uh, best place to do this would be just go to MS learn and, and search for aspire and there'll be tons of videos, tons of, um, articles. Uh, I'm really excited if you, if you go to and find the aspire documentation, you can actually download the docs as, as a PDF. Um, and so, uh, when I was hanging out with you at some conferences earlier in the year, um, I actually downloaded the docs the on time. my iPad and read them on the airplane because I, I'd never read the docs before. I actually, oh. I've been using this thing since last year, but I've never read the docs. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, well, I've been playing with it all weekend and I think it's really cool. I'm going to be playing with it a little bit more this week, but I really appreciate your time, Scott. Thank you so much. I've learned a lot today. No better way to enjoy Aspire than with technology and friends.